The oceans of the past were full of all sorts of weird groups of animals. The sharks we know of today as some of the ocean's top predators were not always in the top of the ecological pyramid. In fact, if you go back in time long enough, they didn't exist at all. Other fish took their spots, but independently evolved the same body shape. One of those groups that may stand on shaky scientific ground is the Tenacanthiformes, but a relatively new fossil find sheds a whole new kind of light on this ancient lineage of sharks. All modern sharks, as well as the rays, skates, and sawfish, belong to the huge group Elasmobranchii. The sharks with us today specifically belong to the subgroup called the Selachii, and it has been around since the early Jurassic about 200 million years ago, give or take. However, the cartilaginous fish, the Chondrichthys group, stretches all the way back to the Silurian period, about 439 million years ago. Fish, as a concept, have been around even longer, but since the term fish isn't a valid scientific one, we won't punch that hornet nest. The second group of Chondrichthians, still alive today, the Holocephalans, filled out a great many niches alongside the Elasmobranx with famous forms like Helicoprion and Edestis. However, one of the more extensive groups of the true Elasmobranx that converged on the modern shark body plan the most were the Tenacanthiforms. This group of cartilaginous fish possessed ornamented fin spines at the front of their dorsal fins and multi-cusped teeth for snagging onto prey. They usually possessed boxy, almost reptile-like heads, broad and large pectoral and pelvic fins, as well as usually large, expansive dorsal fins. Their most obvious feature, with regard to their fins, are the giant spines that jutted out of the front edge of both of their dorsal fins. The different forms of tenacanth sharks had different arrangements, proportions, and sizes of these spines, but this is what they're most known for. Many were average shark sizes, around one meter or two, while some were smaller, but many were also quite large, with body lengths of up to seven meters, 23 feet, and weights of 1,500 to 2,500 kilograms, 3,300 to 5,500 pounds. The problem here is that this group may not be a natural one. The idea of a tenacanth group and its relationship to other cartilaginous fish is still debated, in part due to the restricted nature of the skeletal remains recovered to date. The first description of a tenacanth fossil was that of the Mississippian Tenacanthus major by Louis Agassiz in 1837, based on a poorly preserved isolated spine described as triangular in cross-section and with long ridges of denticles. Subsequently, many other Paleozoic dorsal fin spines that had near-identical to vague similarities to Agassiz's fish were placed within this genus up through the 1980s. In 1884, Ramsey, Traquier, Scottish naturalist and paleontologist, and then the world's fossil fish expert, described the first complete, though poorly preserved, specimen with articulated tenacanth-like spines from the lower Carboniferous Glencartham, Eskdale fossil beds of Scotland, which he designated Tenacanthus costellatus. The condition of the holotype specimen BMNH P5900 limited Drakkar to note that Tenacanthus costellatus was a moderately elongate shark with a blunt snout, having a heterocircal tail, skin covered with a chagrin of placoid denticles, two dorsal fins that each bore a tall spine with rows of longitudinal denticles, and cladodont teeth. Over the next 140-ish years, the Tenacanths would undergo a whole bunch of reworking, some researchers added a whole bunch of genera based on fossils from all over the Devonian and Carboniferous rock records of North America and Europe. Others established some ground traits to define them, while others still rearranged the group. It would bounce from the now defunct Cladosalachii to the constructed order and superorder Tenacanthida and Tenacanthi, respectively to its own group, Tenacanthoidea, within the Eusalachii group, before being formalized as Tenacanthiformes, as it is today. 
hundreds of other specimens of these sharks would be found and described over that 140-ish year chunk as well, with the best skeletal material coming from Goodrichthys escadalensis, Cladoides wildungensis, Hesleroides divergens, Tamiobatus vetustus, Cladodus elegans, plus a yet-to-be-named one from the good old Bear Gulch limestone. 2021 saw the publication of the description of a brand new and extremely well-preserved tenacanth by John Paul Hotnet, Eileen Grogan, Richard Lund, Spencer Lucas, Tom Suazo, David Elliott, and Jesse Pruitt in the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science Bulletin. This new specimen was first discovered in 2013 by an underpaid graduate student while prospecting in the Kinney Brick Quarry, which is an active, privately owned commercial quarry for clay that is used in the production of masonry bricks. The Kinney Brick Quarry is in the Manzanita Mountains, east of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and is well known as a conservat lagastat that preserves the soft tissues of plants and animals, including a fairly diverse fish assemblage. Fossil fish were first reported from the Kinney Brick Quarry in 1975, based on collections made at the quarry in the 1960s by David Dunkel of Dunkelosteus fame and Sergius Mamey. At present, approximately 27 fish taxa have been collected from the Kinney Brick Quarry, which include an acanthodian, 8 cartilaginous fish, 14 rayfin fish, and 3 lobefin fish. Stratigraphy. According to Hotnet and friends, the Dinahas member of the Atrasado Formation at the Kinney Brick Quarry is 56 meters thick, with the majority of the best preserved fossil producing beds coming from a 3 meter thick section divided into 7 units near the quarry floor. The depositional setting of this section presents a regressive embayment or estuary fed by a river delta. The bottom of this 3 meter thick section is a blocky black micrite, with only a few isolated fish remains reported, nothing too special. Above the black micrite is a black banded and slightly fissile calcareous shale from which a few articulated fish have been collected. <sighs> boring. Unit 3 is a fissile banded calcareous shale ranging from black with orange bands near the bottom that grades to a more orange dominated shale at the top where most of the articulated fish have been collected. Ooh, nice stuff. I mean, if you're into fish, I guess. Between units 3 and 4 is a distinct thin laminated gray yellow shale that has produced a number of articulated well preserved fish. Units 4 through 7 also contain articulated and isolated fish remains, though they are not as common as in Unit 3. And these upper units consist of gray, soft, calcareous shale with very well preserved plant fossils, if you're into plants, I guess. The new shark described in the paper was collected from the thin, laminated, gray yellow shale between Units 3 and 4. The Kinney Brick Quarry is estimated to be of late Carboniferous, or Pennsylvanian, or Missourian, or Casamovian age based on the stratigraphic positions of the rock layers within it and the fossils found there. So about 307 to 303 million years ago, give or take. The Creature so, the new shark, specimen NMMNH P68537, or Goji as I think we should call her, is a nearly complete female skeleton preserved on its side. Its body outline is preserved as are some minor bits of soft tissues, not really enough to see organs or anything, but all of the gushy bits are there. The team decided to name the new shark Dracopristus Hoffmanorum, from the Latin Draco, meaning dragon and Latin pristis, intended to mean shark, though some have pointed out that it is often translated as saw, indicating its use as the second half of most sawfish names. However, the root can be either saw or shark depending on who or what you cite, so it doesn't really matter. The species name is in honor of the owners of the Kenny Brick Quarry, Ralph and Jeanette Hoffman. There is also a juvenile specimen known, specimen NMMNH P19181, 
This fossil was originally identified as Orthocanthus huberi, but was later re-identified as a Dracopristus during the description of the first full adult specimen. It provides some new information about the skull, but more preparation is needed to get a full understanding of what it can tell. Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planets the Most Extreme to get an idea of how big Dracopristus was. Dracopristus was a medium-sized tenacanthiform shark with an estimated body length of 206 centimeters, 81 inches, 6.75 feet or 2 meters. Very cool. Thanks, Mr. Man. All the skeleton is articulated or nearly articulated in life position. The forms of the body, the pectoral, pelvic, anal, caudal, and both dorsal fins are preserved from the placement of the dermal denticles or impressions of the fin bones. When all of the bones are reconstructed and put back together in their original placements, this is what you get. The dorsal fin spines were absolutely massive. The spine of the first dorsal fin was massive and rather recurved, sickle-like, and extended beyond the extent of the fleshy fin. In life, the dorsal fin would have been a big ouchie. The spine of the second dorsal fin was only slightly recurved and didn't really stretch past the soft tissue of the fin itself, much less of an ouchie. The skull was short and boxy, with a series of toothy conveyor belts well stocked with bizarre crown or tiara shaped teeth that had a decoration of grooves and ridges. The teeth of Dracopristus are what is called the homodont condition. All of the teeth are the same shape and differ only in size. Unlike some other tenacanths, Dracopristus' teeth were not as heavily adapted for just snagging onto prey items, as the cusps of the teeth are not tall and thin. Instead, these things look like crushers and shearers, being short, fat, but bladed. Overall, a devastating predator. The anatomical features of the skeleton and soft tissue of Dracopristus offer some clues in terms of its ecological role at Kenny Brick Quarry. Dracopristus had large pectoral fins that were what is termed aplesiotic. This means that the cartilaginous supports, the bones of the fin, did not extend throughout the fleshy bits of the fin. These fins have been attributed to living sharks that tend to be slow-cruising pelagic and benthic sharks that use them for accelerating or maneuvering. Other tenacanths such as Tenacanthus consinus and Glencartius have smaller plesiotic pectoral fins, which implies adaptations for fast-swimming pelagic sharks. Dracopristus may have been a more specialized benthic or shallow pelagic shark. Dracopristus could mark the first appearance of a benthic specialized tenacanth within the entire tenacanthiformes, but a more detailed ecomorphological profile is needed for the tenacanthiforms to evaluate this possibility. The Kenny Brick Quarry locality represents an estuarine, lagoon deposition with brackish shallow waters. Evidence of the truly large sharks, such as Glycomanius occidentalis, is pretty much just some dinky teeth. Some researchers suspect that this other tenacanth was actually just a visitor to the Kenny Brick Quarry lagoon from more marine habitats. That might explain its rarity. Dracopristus, therefore, may have been a coastal estuary specialist, similar to some elasmobranch sharks today that can handle both salt and fresh water, like the bull shark or common sawfish. The more important thing that Dracopristus shows is that the Tenacanthiformes group is real and solid. It's monophyletic. In other words, everything within it is indeed evolutionarily related to one another. The Hotnit team also found that the Tenacanthiformes is a sister group to the Eusalachii. Can you imagine one of these things cruising around being all dopey looking? Truly a sea puppy worthy of the title, Godzilla Shark. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.